Um, you guys see my screen? Yes. Yes. Okay, good. All right. All right. So previously, when you do framing design like a steel beam or a girder, what you do, uh, you design to, I'm guess here, to satisfy the requirements, the code requirements, which means strength and deflection. Yeah. So um, what you do here, uh, usually, if you have a beam, you do a check for the strength. So we call this strength design, uh, meaning that the moment demand is gonna be less than the moment capacity or equal to it. And also for the shear strength, you want it to be equal or larger than the shear demand. And then at the end, you do serviceability check. Serviceability means performance. And then you do deflection check. You do deflection um, while you have dead load, it's gonna be based on the steel beam only deflection. And then you do deflection Let's say if we have composite beam, so what you need to do, you do deflection for the composite beam for the total load, life load, and maybe additional dead load, and then you compare it with the code limit. And the code limit is gonna be for dead load deflection, and this applies to structure steel, concrete, and for wood framing, for aluminum framing. It's gonna be the span divided by 360 for the life load deflection, and the span divided by 240 for the total load deflection. When you do deflection, you do service loads. You don't do factor loads, which means you just do it for the dead load, you do it for the life load, and you add them on. This is not the only check that you need to do. Uh, if you look at the code, code says that you need to check deflection and you need to check the strength only, but doesn't talk about floor vibrations. So this can be additional check that you need to do here like it's gonna be like service check. So it's gonna be serviceability check if you like, very similar to deflection check, but here's gonna be about vibration. So when you think here about vibration, you say, just imagine that you're walking in one of these molds after they are open. And uh, um, in some cases you have big stands of steel framing and you walk on it and you feel some vibration. You feel that the entire floor is going up and down, you know? I'm sure that you guys have noticed this. I'd like to hear from you. Have you noticed it in uh, maybe in a gym or maybe in a mall? Have you guys experienced this before? I've experienced it in the parking structure. Parking structure made out of structure steel. This is very rare. It is rare when you have structure steel parking structure. Uh, but oh, even if concrete. it is made out of concrete, also this, uh, I'm going to say vibrations can be an issue. But have you noticed this in the structure steel building, like an office building? or maybe a gym building in a kind of a mixed use, uh, including office building, maybe you're walking there and then you feel that entire floor is going up and down with you. Um, I don't know, have you guys, uh, has anyone been to Ikea before? The one in Costa Mesa or Santa Ana area? Yes. Have you noticed that the floor is kind of bouncing up and down? A little, not yeah. too much, but okay. it's not. Yeah, I, I was... felt it. Not I was there the day I noticed. I went there a couple of times. I didn't notice that it was like you. You're busy buying stuff. <laughs> <reason>. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> yeah, but usually this happens in malls when you see biggest pans and you're walking in front of uh, like stores and all of a sudden the entire floor system is going up and down. I usually notice that because this is like of floor vibration checks. So what, what you do here, if I'd like to go through this, I'd like first to go through the dynamics of structure system. Uh, you guys you have some dynamics, maybe a couple of courses so far, I guess. And you have taken the single degree freedom system, which means any system, I know that usually systems are kind of complex, but we're gonna simplify it to make a system is gonna be composed of a mass, so usually you're gonna have a mass for one system, dynamic system. You're gonna have a spring. And the spring, we're gonna say here, is gonna have a stiffness of K. And the stiffness is gonna be the amount of force needed to displace this mass like one unit. So for example, if um, you're gonna put here, let's say 10 caps to move it one inch, the stiffness is gonna be 10 cap per one inch. So it's gonna be 10 cap per inch. And the mass units is gonna be like the weight divided by G 
like acceleration units. So it's giving the mass m. The amount of displacement is going to be x. And there's something here very important that I just take it out for simplification, which is the damping. You have some damping here. You have something here to eat out the energy. So for example, if you start to take this mass here, you move it, let's say it was certain amount of displacement, you give it displacement, hit it go. It's gonna be going back and forth about the original location. And then at one point, the oscillation is gonna stop, right? It's gonna stop because this damping. So the damping is gonna be eating out the energy that you input to the system. So usually this gives you the mass of this object and this gives you the stiffness the spring factor for the spring that you're, you're looking at. But in many cases, the system is not gonna be that simple. So in that case, we're gonna say, we're gonna have an equivalent mass. The equivalent mass in this simple system is gonna be this M uppercase, while the mass of this object is gonna be M lowercase. In this simple situation, these two values is gonna be the same. They're equal to each other. But on other semi-degree freedom system, they can be a little bit different just because the complexity of it and the way that you attach the spring to the mass to the structure system. Same thing, the K, which means equivalent stiffness of the system, K uppercase, in this case is gonna be the same as this K lowercase for that spring. But I'm not sure if you guys have taken a course in dynamics at which you have seen that these two are not the same, this mass and this mass of the system not the same, and equivalent mass stiffness is not the same as the spring stiffness. Have you guys taken any dynamic courses yet? Yes, yes, professor. So you have experienced this issue. You understand the difference between the two. So for me, if I'd like to do here any uh, dynamic analysis, I need to have these values, which is equivalent. So in this simple case, it just equals to this M lower case. So I need here the equivalent mass and the equivalent stiffness. This is gonna be very critical for me to know of before I start here my analysis. Now, when the system here moves right and left, I'm gonna have set of forces that's gonna get developed. I'm gonna say when I move it right, let go, it means that there's no external applied forces. It's gonna be only internal forces. Why? Because when I just apply here a displacement, I don't really keep my hand pushing it right and left. And this exactly happened during vibrations. So when you have this vibration problem, Usually we assume that external forces get equal to zero. Same thing when you have an earthquake. When you have an earthquake, external forces get equal to zero because actually what happened, you shake the base of the building. You don't really take the building on the top of the building and start to apply any forces. What you do here is just move the building at the bottom, right and left for less than a minute, and then you let go after that. So I'm gonna say here, summation of the forces here is gonna be equal to zero. This means internal force is going to be equal to external force. Now, how much is external force? Let's say it's going to be that simple. It's going to be equal to zero here. How about internal forces? I'm going to say I have two types of forces. I have the force in the spring itself, which means F spring, and the inertia forces. Someone's going to say, where's the damping force? I said, I'm ignoring here the damping system. So I said here, this is going to be for undamped free vibrations. So the damping force is just ignored in this picture intentionally, just to simplify. Mx double dot is giving the inertia forces. It's gonna be equal to the acceleration of this mass multiplied by the mass itself. So you say Mx double dot. Mass time acceleration is giving this inertia force. And the force in the spring is gonna be equal to K, which is stiffness factor multiplied by the displacement. If you remember, I said that K equals to what? Anyone remembers? K equals to the force divided by displacement, right? Which means F divided by X, if I may do it this way, right? So I'm gonna come here and say, now how much is the force in the spring? I'm gonna say F equals K times X, or X uppercase, if you like, it doesn't matter, X, yeah, uppercase. So this here, K times X is gonna be the spring force, Right? And F sub I is gonna be the inertia force. They're gonna be here. Once you add them together, they're gonna be equal to zero. I said, okay. This here, the equation for undamped free vibration. This equation here, we can solve it. There is 
a method to solve it. And based on this, you should be able to find out the initial frequency of that system. What does it mean by initial frequency? Initial period. When I said that I'm gonna be pulling this mass here, put it at certain displacement and let go. So I'm gonna say here is a new location. I'm gonna put it here as a box. I'm gonna let go. Now it's gonna be coming back. It's gonna be going like this. It's gonna start here. It's gonna be going like this original location. It's gonna be going to that side. And then it's gonna stop. Once it's gonna stop, what again? It's gonna be coming back to the original location. It's going to go to here to that side and be going back and forth in cycle. The time is going to be taking this mass to come from the original location that I started at when I pulled this mass out. From that time, when it starts here, it's going to be going all the way to this location on the left side, come back to that location. I'm going to call this the natural period. Meaning, if I start from here, I say, OK, now the mass is moving. It's going to be moving like this. Coming back like this is going to be equal to the initial period of the structure system. This initial period of the structure system is going to be based on what? If I have here a very strong spring, what's going to happen? Vibration is going to be very quick, which means the initial period is going to be very low, but the frequency is going to be high. If I have heavy mass, what would the heavy mass do here for you? Do you think it's going to be increasing the time at which one cycle is going to elapse? Like the initial period is going to reduce it. People are taking dynamics. Uh, it's going to reduce it. So when the mass goes up, what happened here to the initial period? Do you think it's going to be taking more time or less time to go for one cycle? More time. It's going to take a long time. So it's going to be taking more time, which means the natural period is going to be going up and the frequency is going to be going down when the mass goes up. Let's see here what happened for the location. They said here that this location, if you think about it, that you start here at a velocity of zero, and then you go down here, the velocity is gonna be maxed when you come here to the original location. And then it's gonna to start to slow down, right? Because now you are pushing the spring, it's gonna stop here. So the velocity here is gonna be equal to zero. Now it's gonna come back. The velocity is gonna to start to increase. Once it comes here, it's gonna be max. And then after that, now you start to put tension on the spring. Now the spring here is gonna be reducing the force, right? It's gonna be eliminating the velocity that you have in there. And then the velocity is gonna reduce till you come here to a stop. And then you're gonna be repeating the cycle. They say, if you just put here a circle, just imagine that you put here a circle, right? And you put kind of a mass, I'm gonna put it right here. And you're trying to see here what's happening. At the time when you bring this mass right here in this location, you start here to draw the plan view of this, right? You say, okay, in plan view, in reality, it's just gonna be going like this. This is gonna be happening in plan view, right? It can be going right and left, correct? But they say what? This here is equivalent to a mass system that goes along this path, right? With a constant velocity. And you just imagine that you have this experiment, that you have this circular path, right? And then you have this mass here, and then you're looking from the top, and this goes here again with constant velocity. So what's gonna happen? It will never stop, right? Because the velocity is constant. It will never stop. But when you look at it here from the side, if you're looking like here, like as an elevation view, you're gonna feel that once it comes here, even though that this here constant velocity, you feel it stops. Why? Because it's gonna be coming like this, the velocity is gonna reduce. This is the way that you see it. In reality, the velocity is not reducing. And then after this, the velocity is gonna increase till it comes here. And then once it comes here, the velocity is gonna be reducing till it's gonna to come to a full stop. And then it's gonna to start to go again. So in the elevation view, which means this view here, you see that the mass is gonna stop and then it's gonna come back again, it's gonna stop, come back again. But on the plan view, if you are thinking here about this circular path, this actually goes with a constant angular velocity. So, okay. Here is the mass and it goes along this circular path. 
and we call this omega times t for this angle, and omega is gonna be what? The angular velocity. And this is gonna be here, the relationship between the time versus displacement. So this give you the time like one second, two seconds, three seconds. And this give you the displacement away from that point. So this give you like the zero point, it's give you the distance away from it. So imagine that this is gonna be the circular path and you're looking at this from here. Like you're trying here to look at the elevation. The elevation of this looking from here is gonna be the same as this guy here as the division of the strength and the mass. So for us, the, the x distance is giving the location away from the original location, which means from this point, from the zero point, is giving going up and down. Up and down means right and left, does mean uh, like, like the force itself is not gonna be like positive and negative force. It just means the direction. And from one peak to another peak, we're gonna call this natural period which means the time is gonna be taking this mass to start here from this point. It's gonna be taking one complete circle, like one cycle is gonna come back to that location. Now, during this, this time from one peak to another peak is gonna be equal to T, which is an initial period of the system. Uh, if you start here to add some damping or versus no damping, uh, if you recall here, I said that I'm assuming no damping just to make it simple. When you have undamped system, no damping at all, Oscillation is gonna continue forever. It will never stop. Like this dashed line. You see this dashed line, the black dashed line? You can see this give you undamped system. Look what happened here. This give you time versus displacement. I have your positive displacement, negative displacement just means the direction, doesn't mean anything else. So look what happened. It goes like this, here's a dashed line, and you see the amplitude. Amplitude means this height. This, this is here what I call here amplitude is constant. It's not gonna drop down. Why? Because there's nothing here to eat the energy. It's gonna be just start going back and forth, going back and forth, it will never die. Why? Because I have no damping at all. Now, if you like to add here some damping, what's gonna happen? Look here when you add some damping. So this here means damping ratio. I'm gonna write this here. And say this here, what I call here damping ratio. When I add a little bit of damping, I'm gonna make it by percentage. This is just the way I'm gonna be handling it here and they add here 5%, look what happened. After the first cycle, I'm gonna start here to drop. Drop in the amplitude, look what happened. If you like to do, this give you like curved shape, it's give you like this, and then it's give you like this, right? So look at, let's say this give you about, let's say roughly the envelope. And you see here that there's a decay in the amplitude or the maximum displacement that the system is gonna be going to at each cycle. I say, okay, let me add a little bit more damping. So I'm gonna increase the damping here from 5% to 20%. Let's give you this dash blue line, look what happened. Now it is dying much quicker. I said, okay, now I understand. So when you add here more damping, the oscillation is gonna die quicker, which makes sense. Because now we have more, uh, I'm gonna say source for dissipation of the energy that you input to the system at the beginning. The distance here from one peak to another peak is gonna be called natural period, which is this guy here, T. So I guess this give you here natural period. So, okay. This is what I really care about. Or I really care also about the frequency, F. And the frequency is gonna be a number of cycles per second. Okay. Here's my equation, mx double dot, plus kx is gonna be equal to zero. All what I need to do is just divide the whole thing here by the mass, which is not gonna change here my equation because if you take this equation, the equation of motion that we just learned about for undamped free vibration, just divide this by m, divide this by m that you didn't really change it much. Now in here, you cancel m and m, and then this gonna be k divided by m. If you solve this equation here, you find that k over m is gonna be equal to omega squared. And omega is gonna be the angular velocity. Look at this omega m is gonna be equal to square root of k over m. Because I say omega n squared, the natural is gonna be equal to k over m. 
Now, the important equation that I want you to look at that all of you guys know about is going to be this equation here. Natural period is going to be equal to 2 pi square root of m over k. How can I relate this to the system I'm working with? I'm going to go back here. You can see with this system here, I have a mass, I have a stiffness. Damping is not going to be critical when it comes to determination of the initial period or natural frequency. And this is the reason that I'm ignoring the damping ratio in this model. So this model, the reason that I don't have this undamped system is because the damping ratio doesn't greatly affect the natural period and the natural frequency. So only based on K and M, I should be able to find out the natural period, T sub M. And the natural frequency is going to be the inverse of this natural period. So my equation is going to be that simple, 2 pi square root of M over K. And for Fn, the frequency is going to be the inverse of this Tn, the natural period. And this is actually what I care about when it comes to this dynamic analysis. This is the reason I'm kind of running through this section here because I'm not really interested in determining all of this information and studying it because I know that you guys have studied already. So I'm just jumping here to the conclusion, which is equation here for natural period and equation for the frequency, natural frequency that I need to use in my analysis. Bottom line, I have a simple degree of freedom system on them. I have a mass and I have a stiffness and this gave me the equation for natural period Right, and this gives you the equation for the frequency, natural frequency. Any questions? Very good. All good, doctor. All right, thank you, Wayne. All right, now the system I have is different. Look at this system here. If I may go back here a few slides. System we are talking about, it's just a system that vibrates, it goes right and left. It's going to be very similar to a system like this. You're going to have here this lollipop. You're going to have a stick. And I'm going to have this fixed face. So what do you have here? This lollipop just goes back and forth. It's going to be like this. It's going to be oscillating this way. You can pull it to the right, let go. It's going to be going right and left, and it's going to stop. And the stiffness of this post here is going to be the determining factor for the K. So K factors get be based on this post. You can say here's going to be K factor. How about the mass? I'm going to say it's going to be the mass of this object, of this lollipop here. So our system here is going to be so simple because the mass for me is going to be just one point. It's going to be this, what you call here, lumped mass. It's going to be a very small mass if you like. I can say, you know what? This is just too big. I can just do it this way. I'm going to say, yeah, it makes sense. Absolutely. Not to remove this model here. And this gives you the mass of the system, which means this guy here, right? So my mass here is a point. Now let me look here at the system that we're concerned about for the vibrations of the core system. I have simply supported beam. Where is the mass? Do I have a mass as one point? Is the mass like here? It's gonna be just one point, very small point here. I'm guessing no. The mass is distributed, mass is distributed along yeah, the beam. Throughout the, the entire length of the beam. Absolutely correct, Mahim. You are absolutely correct. So the system here is different. So I cannot use the same equation. This equation would have been nice. This could be so simple if I have the mass as lumped mass. But the reality is the mass is distributed. And also the stiffness. Look at the stiffness here. Can I just say the stiffness can be equal to K? The stiffness is equal to K meaning what? Meaning if this system if I may do it this way, it's deflecting like this, right? We like the deformed shape. I guess it's giving the deformed shape when it deforms, right? And the amount of displacement from this point to this point is what we call here X, correct? What was our definition here for this? If I may put it here. I'm gonna say our definition for this displacement is gonna be X equals to what? Anyone recalls? The force divided by, okay. Am I correct? This displacement X is equal to the force, the amount of force that you apply there divided by the stiffness. I said, okay, good. 
which means one mass moves in one direction. This is the reason that I call it here single degree freedom, which means a mass here is going to be only one mass. Displacement is going to be only one displacement for one point. Now let me compare it with here. Where's the mass? You say mass is not just one point. Mass is going to be all of this. Now, which displacement? Are you talking about the maximum displacement? I'm going to say no. For each point throughout this mass, this uniform mass, you're going to have different displacement. So the problem here becomes complex. It's not going to be that simple. I don't have a single degree freedom system anymore. Now I have a system that have uniform distributed mass. And for each point of this mass, I'm going to have different displacement. So OK. Is there anything in the dynamics to address this issue? I'm going to say yes. And they give you here this natural frequency. So I'm not interested in developing this equation. I'm just going to take it as is. Don't forget that this is here is a design course. We need to understand where it's coming from. But when it comes to the basics of dynamics, I'm not going to be going after this. So I'm going to say here, F sub n, which is the natural frequency, is going to be equal to some k sub n. It's going to be this constant. Divide by 2 pi, square root of ei. What is e and what is i? The flexural stiffness, e, the mass plus of elasticity. i is giving the moment of inertia of this beam in the y direction because it's going to be going up and down, right? Divided by m times l to the 4. l is the span. What is m? It's giving the effective mass. So, okay, I have an equation. It's going to be very similar to this equation, just, just a little bit different. Now they say, in this case here, do you have different modes when it comes to vibration of this system? What do you mean? Do you have any other shapes? Do you think that the system may deflect this way? If I may draw it this way. Can it go like this? Would it ever do this? You say no. If it wants to deform, going back and forth, it's gonna be going like this like this line here. Now I need your input, guys, about this issue. Do you think it's going to go like this red line? Can it do something like this? Say, Sir, it may do something like that if we pull it upwards and then release it. If I pull it upward, I'm not going to pull yes. it upward. I have single freedom system, which means I have only one direction of movements. So this will never happen. Why? Because I just pull it right and left, right? It's going to be going right and left. So it's going to be going in this mode. We call this a mode. The other one that I just removed here, we call another mode. So most likely the mode that's going to happen is going to be this mode here, okay? So I said, okay. How about in this beam? Do I have different modes? Say yes. Now, this is unlike this system here, right? Because this is your single degree freedom system. This is going to be continuous, like, like uniform member who's uniform mass distributed, will distributed. And when it comes here to the formation, it may deform like this one, like you see this one. It's going to be that simple. Or like this two, we call this give you the second mode, or this give you the third mode. So I have option. And I'm not certain exactly what would be the final vibration look like? Is it going to be purely like number one, like mode number one, or is it going to be mode number two, or is it going to be mode number three, or maybe combination of all of them, which is most likely to happen. So what's going to happen, I'm going to have a combination of all of this mode shapes when it comes to vibrations. So this mode shapes, if you like to find here, F sub N, Number one, what do you mean by number one? F sub n for the first mode. And you can also find F sub n for the second mode. And also you can find F sub n for the third mode. For each one of these modes, you're gonna have different K sub n factor for constant. Why? Because two pi is gonna be the same. E and I is gonna be the same, right? M and L to the four is gonna be the same for all modes. So the only constants gonna get changed or factor that you're gonna be changing is going to be this case of that. But OK, let's go here to the next slide and see what's happening. For the first mode, second mode, third mode, if you have simply supported beam like the one that we're just looking at, this give you the Kn factor. So K sub n, when you have mode number one, 
is going to be equal to pi squared. For mode number two, four pi squared. For mode number three, it's going to be nine pi squared. Can go back here one slide. Can be going back here to the mode shapes. So if you like to find that f sub n for the first here mode shape, talking here about this mode shape. How do you find here f n for mode number one? You need to use k of n of how much? I'm going to say here pi squared. How about for the second mode? It's going to be four pi squared. How about for the third mode? Nine pi squared. This only applies when you have pin pin or simply supported beam. So now I understand how to treat simply supported beam, right? We'll come to different, I'm going to say here, more shapes. How would you find that if n one and two and three? Now, how about if I have fixed fixed? Like if this beam here is fixed at one end and also fixed at one end, how do you find out this parameter, this f sub n for the first and second and third mode? You said, well, we're going to give you some numerical values that you can use. If you have a cantilever system, it's going to be also the values that you use for the first, second, and third mode. Sir, what yeah. if we have uh, one end fixed and the other is a, a pin support? You or can support? Yeah, absolutely. You can open any dynamics book and find out this factor. This is going to be an easy task. But just, you know, we're going to be interested in only pin pin, like simply supported beams when we come to our analysis. Because this is most likely our frame is going to be built this way. For structure, uh, you know, structure of um, steel for gravity, we don't like to do this continuity. So we're going to be doing this simply supported beams. Okay. Okay. All right. So all right. Now I understand here. This gave me the equation that I'm going to be using. What is this equation? It is an equation to find out the natural frequency of a beam, most likely according to what we're going to be doing here in this class, is going to be simply supported beam. We said it's going to be equal to some constant, k sub n, divided by 2 pi. So it's going to be like also a constant. If you like to call this, the entire term here is going to be for me a constant, right? It does not pays on any of the beam properties. Look at this k sub n. Let's say that I have simply supported looking for the first mode. It's going to be pi squared. You can see here pi squared divided by two pi is going to be pi over to one half of pi. So fine. So this is just a constant. It has not to do with the beam properties. You're going to be looking here at this term, which is related to the beam properties. E, the mass of steel or the material that you are working with, 29,000 ksi, moment of inertia about the xx axis, which means for the movement in the y direction when the beam here goes up and down for deflection. And M is going to be the mass, effective mass, and L is going to be the span to the four. So, okay, good. Also, we have this equation. I'm not sure if you guys remember this equation. This equation says here, deflection for any simply supported beam. I'm sure that you guys are aware of this equation here. It's going to be equal to five W. What is W? Anyone recalls W? What is W? The like the weight, which means mass times G. Yes times L to the four. Would the equation say is L to the four or L cube? The original equation, anyone recalls? L to the four. Is it to the four? Yes, L to the four. Are you sure? Can you confirm this? Do you have any reference? Anything that we studied that says that gives you here the equation? Here it is from one of our slide sets. It says here, five WL to the four divided by 384 EI. Oh, same equation. So this is like the general equation when you have simply supported beam. So what does it mean by this M times G? Is this uniform load? Like as in K per foot? Or this gonna be the total weight? Just wanna be sure that we are on the same page. This is gonna be K per foot, correct? It's going to be like the uniform. It's going to be here, k per foot. Okay. Times L to the fourth divided by 384 EI. Do you see here any similarity between these two equations? I'm looking at this as say, yeah, I have L to the four. I have the mass. You see this? M and L to the four. How about here? I have divided by EI. So if I may take this, L to the four. Can be also taking this mass, 
right? And taking this E on. And the rest, G is what? How much is G value? I'm going to say here 32.2 foot per second square. Constant, numerical value, multiplied by 5 divided by 384. Now I should be able to relate this deflection to this equation here. So I'm going to say, if you take here ML to the fourth divided by EI, I guess I can combine these two equations and come up with this equation here, as Ellen and Moray came up with. So they said natural frequency is going to be equal to 0.18 once you take all of these numerical values and clean the equation a little bit. It's going to be equal to 0.18 square root of G divided by delta, which is displacement. So instead of looking at E and I and looking at the mass and looking at the span and look at all of that, if I just give you a year a beam and they give you deflection in the middle of the beam, maximum deflection, right? Because this equation here is going to be for the maximum deflection. It said the frequency is going to be equal to 0.18 square root of G divided by displacement delta. It looks much nicer, right? It's much simpler than what we are working with. You don't want to work with this system. You'd like to work with this equation here. It's just much simpler. The question is, when it works here, when you are talking about the mass, which mass you're going to be using, which means which weight, because look at the end. I'm going to be looking here at deflection. What does it mean by deflection? Deflection means I need to do this analysis for some given loads. So I need to figure out the load applied on the beam. Is going to be only the self-weight of the beam? So let me go back here and think. When this beam here vibrates, does it vibrate only with the self-weight of the beam or self-weight and concrete when you have concrete deck? Someone's going to say, how about the additional dead load? Would you consider it? Someone else is going to say, how about the life load? Should you consider a fraction of the life load? Hmm. Now it becomes an issue here. What weight would you consider to figure out this displacement? Also, when it comes to this deflection here, which E and which I? I'm going to say E, I understand. It's 29,000 as if this is steel. How about moment of inertia? Which moment of inertia would you consider? Is give you the moment of inertia of the steel beam only or the transport moment of inertia for the steel and the concrete above it? Like the one we have uh, done. The, I am with me for steel and concrete both. So, similarly, W will be for the weight of steel, the concrete, the additional dead load, and the life load. Okay, very good. So when you have a few beams right next to each other, don't you think that they're gonna be all moving together? Or just one beam is gonna be moved by itself? So I'm gonna say, well, no, maybe a few beams is gonna be working together. How many beams do you think is gonna be working together? This is gonna be an issue. How about when you have beams and you have girders? How do you check vibration analysis for the girder? Girders can be different. Because in the girder, you're going to have beams perpendicular to it. And the spacing between a girder and a girder is going to be almost like the spacing from a column to a column. So when you do analysis or vibration check for a beam, or sometimes you call it here a joist, in this case, under this. Um, I'm going to say code section, it's going to be completely different when you do vibration analysis for a girdle. It's completely different. Okay, yeah, it makes sense. So coming up with the load with which you're going to be doing this deflection is going to be an issue that we need to understand it. You're going to say, okay, how about when you have beams and girders and the entire system here is going to be going up and down. It's going to be vibrating. So I need to have your combined effect of beams and girders all together because I cannot just take deflection of the beam and ignore deflection of the girder. Because actually when the girder is deflecting, it's gonna be taking the beam with it from both sides. So the final deflection is gonna be based on the joist or the beam deflection and the girder deflection, not just one of them. Okay. Um, it says here the definition of delta, it says it is the maximum deflection due to the self-weight and any other loads that may be considered to be permanent. Whatever load that you'd like to consider to be permanent, you can just add it here and figure out the amount of this delta. So, okay, makes sense. Let's see the guidelines, AIC. This is actually not in the code. This is an additional check, serviceability check 
that for you as a structural engineer, you'd like to do. Just to be sure that the system is not vibrating that much, like the stores that you were talking about, the molds, and maybe a gem, or maybe a parking structure made out of steel, or maybe concrete. Just give me one check here that you can do. Because not really, again, part of the code. The code says, do a strength design for the moment, for the shear. If you have any torsion, yes, consider it. And then you do serviceability check only for deflection. So the code says, check deflection. The code doesn't say check vibration. But for you as a structure engineer, if you'd like to help your client, if you don't want customers to go back and say, or the users of this building, that we have problem use of vibration, and they're just walking through this corridor, I feel that the entire thing is going up and down, right? So maybe you'd like to do this additional service for him and do this check for vibration. This is okay. How can you do a check here for vibration? When it comes to strength, we said that we have demand and capacity. For flexure strength, we said that we have this Vmn and then we have this M sub U. Vmn is what? The strength, inflection, the moment strength, and the M sub U is giving the moment demand. For the shear, we say we have PVN, the strength, and V sub U is giving the demand. For deflection, we said here is the demand, which means total deflection or live load deflection, and here's the limit. So for the surface severity, we have limits. Same thing here. In order for us, for people to be satisfied or to feel comfortable while you are using this building or this place, if you have an office or residence, we're going to be checking here the peak acceleration of the floor system going up and down. They said here that the peak acceleration, the limit, is going to be 0.5 percent, half percent of G. So if G here is going to be 32.2, you're going to be taking here 1 percent of it, it's going to be 3.22. Now take half of this. This is going to be like 1.6. 1.6 foot per second squared is going to be the maximum which is very low. So this here, what you're looking here at is gonna be the limit. You cannot have the limit to go beyond this. So again, for deflection, we determine the deflection due to live load and total load compared to the limit. In this case, we need to determine here the peak acceleration. So what is the peak acceleration? What should I call it? Is this demand or capacity? You can say this is gonna be the demand, right? You're gonna be calculating the peak acceleration. And where is the limit? You can see here is the limit, half percent of G. Good, it's gonna be for an office or residence. So I guess you're gonna be sitting, you're not gonna be walking. So if you feel any vibration, your feeling for the vibration is gonna be high. If you are playing in a gym and exercising, your feeling for vibration is gonna be much less because you're really vibrating, you're going up and down, you're running and you're doing some activities. So you're feeling to it, it's going to be less, which means we can bring this limit a little bit higher. So it says here, when the people are taking part of the activity or some activity, running, walking, whatever, right? So we can accept vibrations of 5% of G to 15% of G. This here, big difference. So if you have an office or residence, you don't allow lots of vibrations. But if you are in a place that Almost everybody is gonna be walking or moving or exercising or playing. You're gonna allow more acceleration. So the limit here is gonna be different based on the use or occupancy, if you like. Any questions? Hello? We're good? Um, sir, what is the value of G again? G? Yes, sir. Grab the acceleration. Yes, sir. Anyone can help me with this? Uh, 32.2 per second squared. <clears throat> or or uh, 9.8 if uh, <laughs> we're using SI yeah, units. Fine. This is what you do, right? 9.81, not 981. This gave you too much. Just a factor of 100. <laughs> so this gave you like the typical standard values that we use when we come to our analysis, right? Are you good, Mahin? Okay. Yes, right. sir. Great. Okay, good. So again, this gave you here the limit, right? 
this can be the limit if you're on an office, but if you're in a place and people are jumping around, you can increase this limit to 5%, like 10 times or 15% G. Yeah, makes sense. Because people's gonna be moving, you don't feel the shaking and the vibration that much. Let's say, okay. We have this chart here, and this chart is taken from this design guide. This is gonna be the AIC design guide is about this floor vibration thing. They say, look at this limit here. This gave you the curve that you'd like to use. It says that this gave you here for offices and residences. This is what we call here quiet area. Look at this. So what is in the X axis? What's giving the Y axis? And the Y axis is giving the peak acceleration as a percentage. So this here means half a percent. This here means, how much is this? 25%, this quarter of G. So this 0.25 multiplied by 32.2 foot per second square. So okay, now I understand the Y component. About the X axis, it says you the frequency of what? Of the system. If the frequency here is going to be, let's say, between 4 to 8 hertz, what's going to happen? Your limit is going to be half percent. When you go lower or higher, right, the limit is going to be going up, as you see here. So fine, understood. But if you like, if you don't want to look here at the frequency and you just like to have a flat line, you can do it this way, which means that you're going to be taking here some conservative approach. You just limit it here to half percent throughout the entire spectra of this frequency. So this can be up to you. You can just say my max is gonna be half percent and use it, or you can play with this. If you like, you call this short here, and let's say if the frequency is 20, so you have up to maybe one. Look at this. It's like almost a little bit over one, maybe one and a quarter here. So if you have like 20 hertz for the system. Okay, maybe one and a quarter. One and a quarter percent of what? Of G. So the limit here is going to be higher, much higher than what you have here for half percent. Uh, questions? Or we're good. Just continue. Now, question here for you. Is this a limit or this is a demand? Is this going to be the actual acceleration that you're going to be working with, or this is just to give you the limit, the maximum that you can go to? Limit. This is a limit, right? It says here in red. Here's the limit, right? If you are working in shopping malls, oh, you see this? It's going to be completely different. It's going to be one and a half percent. Outdoor pedestrian bridge, oh, it's going to be much more because everybody just walking and we're running or biking or whatever. Okay, good. So I guess I understand the chart, understand maybe half percent for office. And if I'd like to push it a little bit, if let's say the beam is not working, I'd like to use this chart, I should be fine. Okay, good. So here's the first, uh, this gave you chapter two about this limit. So chapter two in this series, this the design guide is gonna include this chart here to give you the limit for vibration. And chapter three is about how do you find out this natural frequency? I said, okay, natural frequency. I guess we went through this. You can say, yes, I'm gonna go back here a few slides. I said, yeah, we talked about this, but this is just, just a discussion. But start from this point here, I'd like here to address what we are talking about when it comes to AIC, the seal design guide, the series 11. I said, okay, now I understand. So here, that was just an open discussion for the first 11, um, I'm gonna say slides, it was like an introduction. And after this, I'm gonna be taking an element by element and try to understand it. So in chapter two, I have the limit, right? Like the capacity, what, what is the maximum that you're gonna be allowed on your floor? And here, it's gonna be how you determine the frequency. Let's say the determination of the frequency is gonna be based on this equation. Great f n pi over two. Yeah, I have seen this. So uh, one half means the square root of, and this is exactly the same one that we have seen, that we have worked with. But here's the one that I'd like to work with or like to see. This f n is going to be 0.18 square root of g, which is the 32.24 per second squared divided by deflection. 
this is, I guess, this slide here in number 16, this equation is gonna be the same as this equation. Exactly the same. It's gonna be 0.18 G divided by delta under the square root sign. You see, yeah, here it is. It's gonna be the general equation for any beam. But the same here, if you have a system of beams and girders and you're trying to find out the combined effect, right? They say, first you need to do the frequency for the beam or the joist. You see this F sub J. So when you see here sub J, you understand it's gonna be about a joist or a beam. And F sub G is gonna be for the girder. If you like to see here the combined effect or the frequency of the combined system between beams and girders, this is what you need to do. First, you need to find the frequency for beams and then you do the frequency for girders and then you combine it with this equation here. But okay, I understand. I guess this is here very clear. And they say here, this deflection is gonna be equal to five W L to the four divided by 384 E times I. What is this I T? Y T? You see, it's give you the transformed value, which means conserve the concrete and convert the concrete into steam. How about ES? It's give you for the steam, not the concrete. So you need to consider this beam here to be steel, find out the transformed value for I, the moment of inertia, and then use this equation to find out this delta. This is here all in chapter three. I'm not gonna say in the code, I'm gonna say in the IEC, the steel design manual. So if you like to find here the combined effect, since you understand this equation, to find out the combined natural frequency, for the entire system, you can simply bring all of this, these two frequency and put them in this equation like this. You say Fn is gonna be equal to 0.18 square root of G and then you just add displacement from the joist and displacement of the girder to each other like this. Joist meaning a beam and the girders give you the supporting main element supporting the beams. Okay, so this gave you the bottom equation. This gave you the final equation that you'd like to use. Whenever you have combined system, this gives you your equation for natural frequency. This gives you 0.18 square root of G divided by summation of displacement from each element. How about if I don't have girders? Is it true that I may have a structure with no girders? I'm gonna say yes. This may happen, and you just imagine here for a second that you have a concrete wall, maybe another concrete wall, and you know the flex of concrete wall is nothing, right? It's not gonna go up and down. And then you have a few beams running this way, right? Now in this case, do you have girders? See, no, because it's your concrete wall. It doesn't go up and down. It does not deflect. The problem happened when I have a girder here that girders is gonna be deflecting while the beam is also deflecting. So total deflection that you're gonna see here in the middle of the beam is gonna be equal to what? Deflection of the girder at this point plus deflection of the beam at that point. This way, this is the reason that we have this combined effect equation. But when I have concrete beam here, concrete wall here and concrete wall here, right? Then I have beams running across between the walls. Now I don't have any girder effect. And I guess using the, this equation and call this to be delta sub J, it's gonna be sufficient, which means just put this here equals to what? In this case, it's gonna be equal to zero. If I have a situation like this. Are we good about this? Did you guys hear it from me? Yes? Yeah. Gotcha. Any question on this specific assumption that is just made? Sir, even uh, when we use delta J, when we also add delta J, because delta J also has the value of delta J. I mean, um, have, you it, said it doesn't have this delta enjoys... G. It doesn't have this delta G. This delta J, assuming that it's gonna be only displacement for or deflection for only this beam, it doesn't concern the deflection of the girder itself. Because when you take the beam, when you take the beam, when you take this beam and do analysis for it under dead load and life load, do you consider that this end here is fixed or is gonna be going up and down? I'm not saying fixed means fixed to you, resistant rotation. It's gonna be simply supported, right? Do you consider that this support here goes up and down? When I use this equation here, 
for this simply supported beam. Here's a simply supported beam, right? I'm gonna be using here, I am gonna have here a support, right? And here I'm gonna have a support, right? Then I'm gonna be doing deflection analysis with this equation. This equation here is gonna get you the maximum deflection at the middle span, right? Now in this equation does not, or it does include deflection of the support or movement of the support downwards. You can say this here, very simple equation. It assumed that both of these two supports are in place. They're not gonna be coming down at all. But in reality, when you have a grid of framing and you have beams and girders, this beam is gonna be deflecting. And at the same time, the girder also is gonna be deflecting down. So the displacement of this beam only is gonna be called delta sub j, like in here. And this place of the girder only is gonna be called delta sub g. So if I have a situation when I have two continuous concrete walls and they have beams running across, do I have any this delta g effect on it? Do I have any girder and the girder is deflecting? I'm guessing no. And in this case, all what I care about is just delta of the beam. Are we good about this? This can be actually in your meter, this coming meter, right? Okay, sir. And it sir, it's very uh, confusing if you don't know what I'm talking about. And sir, if uh, we have girders, but we are only asked for uh, the beam, then we don't have to add delta G, right? You have to, in because the denominator. when this vibrates here, it takes this with it. If you have a girder, right, and you have a beam, when the beam is going up and down, the girder also is moving up and down. So you need to consider the combined effect. So if you're asked about one of them, we have to consider both of them? Yeah, because the whole system works together. Unless you're gonna be going here to the girder and say, you know what, this girder is not gonna be going up and down, like in this case. Okay. Okay, good. Uh, professor? Yes. Uh, Delta J says beam or joist and girder. So is that total then? No, this Delta J is gonna be the beam or joist and girder mid span deflection. So for example, no, this applies only for this guy, not for this guy. It applies only for this guy. Once we go through the example, you're gonna see the numbers. How about that? Make sense, Andres? Yeah, makes sense. Okay, Lowry, sorry. All right, so here we discussed again, chapter two, the limit, right? Chapter three is what? Initial frequency. Chapter four, how do you find out the acceleration? Which acceleration? The acceleration that you're trying to find the limit for. You see here, when you go back to chapter two, it says the peak acceleration cannot be more than half percent of the G. So how do you find out this peak acceleration, your demand, right? So it says here, we have this equation. The equation is gonna be very simple. It says AP divided by G. What is AP? I'm gonna say the acceleration. So when you say here, AP divided by G, what does it mean? The percentage. So this AG divided by, AP divided by G cannot be more than half percent. This is what they say. It's gonna be half percent. The entire thing here, this AP divided by G. Because AP is gonna be like in foot per second squared. Divided by G is gonna be a fraction, like a ratio. It's gonna be equal to P sub zero, some given force. It's gonna be constant. E to the negative 0.35 F sub N. Okay. This gives you the frequency of the system. Divide by beta. Beta sounds like this damping thing. This beta is gonna be about the damping. Multiply by W. And what is W? The weight. This equation is gonna be that simple. But the problem is how much is this P sub zero? How much is this F sub N? Say F sub N, yeah, we know how to do F sub N. How much is this beta that I don't know yet? And how much is the weight that you want me to consider in this analysis? Okay, what is the maximum? Where's the limit here? 
in this table 4-1, they say whenever that you have an office, it's going to be half percent. Okay. Where is this chart? I thought that it's going to be half percent for certain range. I'm thinking here, where is this chart? Why I don't see it here? Well, as I told you at the beginning, you just assume this is going to be your limit as a designer, right? But you need to understand once you go here beyond a range of four to eight hertz, right? Once you go a little bit beyond that in both sides, either lower than four or more than eight, you know that you have some range here that you can work with. So for example, if you have 0.6 for the peak acceleration, 0.6%, and you are at 15, then you're not gonna say, no, this beam is not good, I need to change it. You're just gonna let go, you're gonna accept it. But preferably, if you can keep everything within half percent, this give you like the preferred if you can. If you cannot, this is fine once you go beyond eight and lower than four hertz. Okay, let me here move forward to this slide number 18. Now I need to work here with this equation. I need to understand how to figure out this acceleration. So AP over G is giving the factor that I need to compare with half percent or one and a half percent for shopping malls, right? How about P sub zero and all of these factors I'm gonna be going here, same equation again, so that I know exactly these factors. It says here, this P sub zero is gonna be constant. It's gonna be 65 pounds. It's gonna be like the applied force causing the vibration, fine. F sub N, the natural frequency of the system. Decode here of the panel or the combined panel. So it depends what system that you like here to do check on. You have combined system, we have just a set of some beams. How about the girder effect? How about beta? Says the damping ratio. So this beta is giving you the damping ratio. Now let's work here on beta, the damping ratio. Okay. This beta that you have here in this equation is giving some measure of all the betas coming from all different sources. Say, so how is that? They say, look at this here, this equation. It says beta is gonna be equal to some measure of beta sub i. Beta sub i means beta one, two, and three, depends on the source that this beta is coming from. And usually it's gonna be by percentage. Okay, good. Say for any structure system, because you have a steel system, you just have 1%. This is gonna be 0.01 means what? 1%. If you have ceiling on some duct work, this is gonna be adding here 1% here, which means if you don't put a ceiling and there's no ducts like above the ceiling, you're gonna be losing this 1%. Don't count for anything. If I have your apartment structure, I don't have a ceiling. I don't have much duct work to provide any damping. So I'm gonna be taking this out. But if I have an office space, I can say, certainly, ceiling is gonna be there and duct work is gonna be there. I'm gonna have lots of ducts, mechanical components, electrical components, I can add this 1%. So now I know for any system, you're gonna have this 1%. When you have ceiling and ducts, like an office or residential, add this 1%. Now it depends on the office use. I mean, do you have an office with lots of paperwork, lots of papers can be around or just computer system? It is gonna be like, like paper office fit out is gonna be one percent. It's gonna be like computer office fit out is gonna be half percent. Okay. So since we're talking about an office, can be asking here. Do you guys now nowadays do you expect that you're gonna have tons of paperwork in the office? I'm gonna say no. Most likely you're gonna be going with this now. In the past, we used to ask the client, how do you guys feel? Do you think you're gonna have lots of paper or, I mean, or it's gonna be now like computer system. So nowadays we don't ask, we just consider this. If you have a church or a school or a mall, don't add anything, nothing to be added for this. If you have some drywall partitions, so you can add somewhere between 2% to 5%. Now we don't know because at the beginning you're just doing the core and shell of the office building. So you don't know exactly how the number of partitions and the layout of them. So we're gonna be using this for now. Just take this 2%. So if I'm working here in an office, I'm gonna say, well, let me take this 1% for the structure. 
can be adding this. I'm gonna have ceiling and ductwork. I'm gonna have this. How much is this? And this is gonna be two and a half percent, correct? Which means like this, 0 .02, 0 0.025 for two and a half percent. So in your equation in the analysis, you're gonna be using this number here, 0 0.025. If you have all supportation, look at this. You're gonna be adding here two percent. This is gonna be 0 0.045. If you have an office, this number is going to be much larger. And don't forget, this gave you the number that you use in your analysis, right? This gave you 0 0.025. So this beta here, according to this quick example, is going to be 0 0.025, like this number here. And you have some explanation. It says, for example, a floor with ceiling and duct supporting an electronic office area has a beta of, and then they list all the stuff. Provide that you're going to have maybe an open floor system, like in an office, open floor system, like you have cubicles. But if you have some partitions, you can add this 2%. So in this case, in the example here above, you don't have these partitions. You say, well, we don't have a partition system. How about the weight? They say the weight is going to be as simple as this the weight that using this equation. In the previous equation, AP divided by G is going to be equal to some uniform load, supported load, like uniform PSF, multiplied by some width, effective width, that I don't know how to determine it yet, multiplied by L, which is the member length, the member span. Okay, getting close. So I'm going to go back here. This W is going to be equal to the uniform load that I need to figure out how to determine it and what it includes. And then you have this beta that we just went through. Now I understand how to figure out this beta, depends on the occupancy. And they have this P sub zero, 65 pounds, is gonna be just constant. And F sub N is gonna be based on the structure system and the combined effect of the joist for the beam and the girder. And with that, I should be able to find out AP divided by G. Once you find this out, AP divided by G, you compare it with what? With the limit, the half percent. If you are lower than this limit, everything is good. You're done. If you are not, something needs to change. Now, my question to you is, what would you change here in this equation to make it work? You cannot change the limit because limit is gonna be based on the occupancy. It says office, you have this limit. You cannot play with this unless you can prove with the frequency that you are beyond eight or lower than four, like in here. If I may go back quick here. If you are beyond this eight and lower than four, then you start to say, well, I have here some room, right? But beside this point here, what would you change in this equation to make it work? I'm gonna make it here. I'm gonna say, can you play with the damping? Are you sure that you're not gonna put some partitions? because partitions can help a lot. As you see here, this equation here is gonna be sensitive to any partitions. So once you start here to add partitions, it's gonna double this amount. This is here 0.025 is gonna become all of a sudden 0 0.045. Guess what's gonna add to this equation? It's gonna be directly proportional to, uh, inversely proportional to A sub P. So once you add a little bit of damping in here, it's gonna cut down the acceleration. Okay, what else would you change? You can see the weight. Do you think that adding the weight is gonna help out? And you can see yes. Adding the weight to the system is gonna reduce this amplification or this acceleration here. I'm gonna stop at this point. If you have any questions, please go ahead and ask. Otherwise, please um, sign out. And for this people, uh, the list that I put there, please meet me at the office hour. Thank you.